Good evening, everyone, and you're all very welcome to tonight's webinar, which has been brought to you tonight by the advisory staff here in County Mayo. My name is Brendan Gary. I work in Chagas and Ballinrobe, and tonight, for the next hour, I'm delighted to be your host for this evening's webinar. Now, tonight, the focus switches to examining farm forestry as a land use option, and we'll also look at the new technologies in terms of renewable energy that are available. And these are two topics that we'll hear more about as we move through this decade. Now, tonight, our first speaker will be Noel Kennedy, a Chagas Forestry Advisor based in Chagas and Roscommon, and Noel will give us an update on farm forestry. By later this evening, Barry Caslin, the Chagas Energy and Rural Development Specialist based in Chagas and Longford, and Barry will give us an update on these new technologies available to Irish farmers. Now, you, the viewers, are being encouraged there to engage with our panellists here tonight, and we ask you to type your questions into the Q&A tablet tab at the bottom of your screens, phones or tablets. And later this evening, my colleague Inda Gagan from Chagas and Ballina will put your questions live to our panellists here tonight. So please type your questions into the Q&A box. And later, after the two presentations, we'll have a short poll to gauge your thoughts on these two topics. So stay tuned for that. Now, this webinar has been recorded and will be available to watch back on the Chagas Mayo YouTube channel in the coming days. So without further delay, I'm now going to ask you, Noel, to start sharing your presentation with us and it's over to you now Noel. Can I just get you to make that full yeah. screen Noel? Yeah. Is that everyone can see that? Yeah that's perfect Noel. That's great thank you very much. Um, so listen um, I'd say, like to say hello to all the viewers there and uh, thanks to Brendan for the opportunity to um, give an update and an overview really of, of forestry uh, as we are at the moment. So without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start off. So uh, the title of my presentation for the next 20 minutes or so is Planting and Managing a New Forest. So really what we're talking about here as regards a forest is planting a crop of trees on agricultural land. And that's, that's an important, uh, I suppose, um, class, I suppose, our, our, sorry, way of uh, defining forestry, because I suppose over the years, um, we would associate forests with uh, a whole range of land and particularly with, with quite poor land. Um, the type of land that's now eligible for forestry is a much uh, narrower uh, type of land and it's coming much more into conventional farming ground. But this is what forestry does. It, it, um, it grows uh, timber, uh, native woodlands uh, and the opportunity for, for forest owners to um, indeed uh, benefit financially and also maybe to set up small businesses, maybe in the area of firewood processing. Uh, there are many benefits and services that uh, forestry provides apart from providing maybe farmers with uh, a more a productive use of um, marginal land. Obviously it produces uh, potentially valuable timber and we have very stronger a very strong timber processing sector. Uh, the environmental benefits are, uh, of course, widely recognized from water quality to biodiversity enhancement, and particularly uh, with the, I suppose, the whole uh, concern about climate change, the ability of our forests to take in uh, CO2, store it as timber, and then release uh, clean air into the atmosphere. The planting of forests in Ireland is supported by the afforestation scheme, which is administered by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. It offers a planting grant and an annual forestry premium to all uh, landowners in the country. Um, it's administered by DAFM. Uh, it is, uh, supports the planting of agricultural land. Uh, and obviously, um, applicants with the legal right to use use the land are entitled to apply to plant that uh, and the application requires the services of a registered forester. So these are professional foresters that are registered with the Department of Agriculture and they're all in the private, private sector foresters. It's important that uh, when you're considering forestry to bear in mind that under the Forestry Act the land must remain under forest cover so therefore, if you do cut down a forest, um, there is a replanting requirement. Uh, forestry probably has been getting a lot of negative press there over the past couple of years due to backlogs in the processing of applications. And this essentially is down to the level of environmental assessment that um, forestry applications are subject to. 
but also that there is a public consultation element to all forestry applications uh, for planting land, for building forest roads and for felling, light, felling trees. And a, a combination of these, I suppose, has resulted in, in quite long delays, uh, which, which are being addressed by the department uh, at the moment. So if you're thinking about uh, forestry, um, you might wonder, well, 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 why, why are you planting? There might be very many reasons, uh, or you might have a single reason. It might be just that you have some poor land that you're you're hoping to maybe um, get better use out of it, maybe get or get better return from. Um, you might be thinking of retiring from farming and looking at how you know that land is going to be passed on to maybe the family. Uh, you may be very aware of the carbon issues that are there at the moment. Um, uh, biodiversity and water quality um, uh, concerns as well, the opportunities for a new renewable energy and how does forestry interact with the farming schemes that are there at the moment uh, and indeed uh, what grants and premiums are available and, and are they attractive enough to, um, to entice you to look at uh, planting land and indeed um, not too far away now is the new cap and um, are there going to be opportunities uh, for forestry in the new cap. So one of the things that uh, you might be wondering as a farmer is, well, how does forestry interact with the current farming schemes? And they interact in various ways, I suppose. The great news is that um, uh, forestry that's planted in 2022 and meets a couple of fairly straightforward uh, terms and conditions um, will be eligible. Uh, to receive the basic payment as you had been drawing it down on your, 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 your forage to date. So eligible land that was declared in a single farm payment uh, for a single farm payment and drew down that payment in 2008 and which will be planted in 2022 can continue to be eligible for a BPS payment in 22, uh, 2022 provided that the herd number uh, is associated with the forestry premium applicant. So in other words, that um, uh, th th it's the same person who is planting uh, and is also uh, looking to draw down a basic payment. And this is, this is an issue that has arisen actually where forestry has been transferred, say within a family or indeed to, uh, to somebody, uh, to a third party. And um, there was an assumption that the basic payment could automatically uh, be claimed, but it's very important that the, the herd number uh, owner uh, is also associated with the forestry premium. Um, the good news is that uh, the eligibility for basic payment continues uh, after forestry premiums finish, and we are optimistic uh, uh, that uh, this will continue uh, into the new uh, uh, scheme that will replace basic payment uh, under the new cap. In relation to areas of natural constraint, uh, as you know, there is a threshold payment area of 30 to 34 hectares, depending on your, your land type. And areas, uh, if your farm is greater than this threshold, that uh, land over and above the 30 or 34 hectares can be planted with no loss of ANC. The gloss and the reap schemes are a little bit more tricky. Conversion to forestry is restricted um, and clawback may apply, but land outside of those schemes can be planted. But uh, again, speak to your, your farm advisor uh, specifically in relation to those schemes. This is the, uh, the list of, uh, of forestry options that are there. There are 12 different uh, forestry um, options there, what we call grant and premium uh, classes. And they, each of them bring with them um, a different rate of forestry planting grant or what we call the afforestation grant. Um, in the one piece of land, you can have a combination of any of those um, particular grant and premium classifications if they are, if the land is suitable for it. So just to give an example, in Mayo, the most common planting option is what we call GPC3. And that's the planting of Sitka spruce plus 15% broadleaf trees plus 15% biodiversity area. 
and that attracts an afforestation grant of 3,815 euro per hectare and an annual premium of up to 520 euro per hectare. Uh, an increasingly popular choice is the na native woodland establishment where you're planting all native trees and that attracts the highest forestation grant of, of up to 6,220 euro per hectare and an annual premium of up to 680 euro per hectare. Again, there's been a lot of talk about agroforestry where you're combining forestry and farming. And the grant here is 6,220 with an annual premium of up to 660 euro per hectare. But in this case, it's only paid for five years. And that is that five year uh, premium payment is seen as a drawback to attracting um, farmers into agroforestry. And that is definitely being looked at for um, uh, 2023. So what does that a forestation grant cover? Well, in the majority of situations, it is designed to cover the full cost of planting uh, your forest and also maintaining those trees for the first four years. Um, so the idea is that the farmer or the, the landowner uh, should not incur um, any cost uh, from, the, uh, from planting their land in relation to the the the, the forestry uh, the afforestation grant um now uh, in recent times uh, there have been additional costs for in further environmental assessment so that's something that would need to be uh, discussed with your forester uh, and definitely it is something that the department of agriculture is looking at to see um can they um i suppose improve that situation for potential forestry applicants so I'm just going to give you a sort of um, a guide through maybe a typical <clears throat> planting application um, and just show you the different steps that are involved in, uh, I suppose, bringing it through the application and approval process. So this would be really any block of land, but this is a 24 hectare farm um, on, I suppose, mixed ground. Uh, when you look at the, I suppose there's access, so there's, there's ro road access, <coughs> excuse me, and I would say that good road access is very important, both in the short, but particularly in the longer term, when you're looking to uh, have um, efficient uh, timber harvesting and, I suppose, timber removal by, by, by timber lorries. So good access to your forestry plots is important. If you look at the contours of the land in question here, you'll see that um, there are that it is undulating land. It's probably typical drumlin type land with slopes. And this is the fall. OK, so the, the fall of the land is very important, obviously, to to uh, optimizing uh, the drainage of the land. And therefore, that will dictate the, the type and, I suppose, direction of cultivation uh, in preparation for planting. And when the forester walks the land, the forester has identified what type of soils uh, are there. And in this case, he has found in the front section here, a typical sort of um, uh, mineral, mineral soil, poorly draining um, acidic, uh, which is typical of a lot of, a lot of our soils in Mayo. Then uh, further, maybe uh, on the, 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 the lower slopes and slight slopes that um, you have better drained, just better quality uh, farming ground. And then towards the back, towards the river, um, there is uh, where there is occasional flooding. Uh, that is a more alluvial soil type. So what the forester then must address is uh, whether or not uh, there is an environmental sensitivity. And in this case, there is a special area of conservation. So there has to be um, uh, a, an environmental assessment based on the water body, uh, which is causing a floodplain. There's also a remnant oak woodland. There is a ring fort, which may or not, may not be uh, an issue, but in this case will not be an issue. And uh, there's also something to bear in mind is that there is an ESB line. 
and very importantly, a, a, a significant stream that is running along by the land and feeding into uh, that SAC. And that would certainly be a, uh, uh, something that uh, will be environmentally assessed for its potential impact on planting. So these are the areas that were identified for planting. These are the, uh, the planting types. So you can see here that um, in these areas, there was the GP seat Sitka spruce. And at the back here, in uh, adjacent to the um, SAC, but outside of the floodplain, there was GPC9, which is native woodland. In total, it's proposed to plant 10.8 hectares here. And the premium here currently will uh, amount to just sh shy of seven and a half thousand euro per year. Uh, plus, uh, I would hope in this case, the basic payment uh, will also be payable on those forestry areas. So just moving on there from the planting scenario is, well, what happens to the, to the young forest after it is planted? And the first four years of the life of a young forest, we call the establishment period. And it's very important that owners um, uh, are familiar with their forest, don't walk away from it, actually walk through it and be familiar with it and keep in contact with your forester because at the end of the day, this is your investment. Uh, there, there will be a number of challenges to those young trees and that includes um, uh, uh, weed control, uh, it includes potential frost damage, and it's very, very important that there will be sufficient number of trees growing by year four or year five to meet the requirements of the, the second installment of the maintenance grant. Oh, sorry now, that seems to have stopped working. I beg your pardon there now. Brendan, are you seeing that okay? That's fine again, no, no, yeah, thank yep. you. Okay. Okay, that seems to have stopped. The little pointers at the bottom, maybe no, let us maybe skip on to the next slide, maybe even. Yeah. Okay. I'll do it this way if that's all right. That's fine, no, yeah. Yeah, all right. So apologies for that. Um, so by year four, year five, the what's called the second installment or the maintenance grant falls due. And uh, in the majority of cases, your forester has, has undertaken not only to plant, but also to look after your, your trees. So we're talking here uh, uh, that the second installment, that's worth a total of 25% of the afforestation grant. Um, the forest must be established. And by that, we mean that the trees are healthy that they're growing clear of vegetation and that at least 90% of the original trees is growing. Now, failure to achieve the second installment, and there may be good reasons for that, uh, if it goes on for more than two or three years, it will risk the ongoing payment of the uh, forestry premium. Um, just, just see if this will come on here now. Okay, we're back in business. So just after year four, just to give you a very quick tour of, of how the forest grows. So hopefully it grows, it continues to grow well. Keep an eye on the fences, particularly after storms like we've had over the past few days. If you have a forest adjoining a bog, um, if you have a fire break, which you should have, make sure that it's maintained. Uh, forestry owners with, with good quality broadleaves should continue to prune them to improve quality. And for conifer owners coming to year 12, 13 to improve access in advance of thinning, you need to be cutting inspection paths. And then first thinning will occur about year 17 or year 18 in the conifers. This will hopefully lead on to a, a very valuable uh, series of thinnings and clear fells. And eventually you're back to replanting or reforestation. An alternative approach that will become more prevalent in the next number of years is what, it's what's called continuous cover forestry, where you do not clear fell, but as you thin, you introduce young trees. And at the moment, the sale of timber from conifer thinnings and clear fells will net you 
in the region of 25 to 35,000 euro per hectare, and that is currently exempt of income tax. Now, as Barry is talking shortly about uh, uh, renewable energy opportunities on the farm, I'd just like to highlight that um, apart from the, uh, I suppose, commercial timber, forestry can offer uh, a very important source of renewable energy, particularly from the lower value thinnings or pulpwood, which can be converted into either firewood, in the case of maybe both hardwoods and softwoods, but also into wood chip. As you can see here, the timber is being chipped into, uh, in, in, into the truck. Uh, that is then fed into, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, you might say a wood chip uh, bunker or feedlot and that is then used to uh, fuel um, various different sizes of biomass boilers. And this is one that you might be familiar with. This is the Orivo um, milk powder plant in Balhadreen, which is taking about 30 to 35,000 tons of wood chip a year to fuel its biomass boiler. And of course, this is a carbon neutral cycle because the carbon that the tree has produced as timber when it is burnt, it, it emits as CO2, but it is a carbon neutral. It is then reabsorbed by the other forests and the whole cycle begins again. Just quickly about future developments, uh, the concerns about the backlogs and, and new forestry strategy. The minister has a, a very comprehensive project woodland ongoing and that hopefully will resolve uh, a number of the issues. The Climate Action Plan is aiming for 8,000 hectares of new forests per annum. In 2023, there will be a new forestry program uh, in uh, sort of as a follow-on to the new CAP. Um, there will be uh, incentives to encourage small-scale, what we'd call native protection forests, partic particularly to protect vulnerable uh, waterways. And under the new cap, uh, there should be new tree planting opportun opportunities under the new agri-environment and eco schemes. For any of the forestry owners who may be watching, remember, do apply for your 2022 forestry premium if you haven't done so. It has to be done online. So go into your agfood.ie account. And um, if you have an issue with your username, password or PAC code, there are there is the Ag Food help desk to contact. If you have issues with the actual payment of your forestry premium, there is also a forest premium help desk that you can ring. What can Chagas do for you? Uh, well, I, as a forestry advisor for Chagas, I offer independent, objective, and free advice. Um, th those are my contact details, but I can also be contacted through your local advisor or advisory office. And in March, later in March, uh, I will be organizing an afforestation uh, walk and there will be details provided later about that. OK, so um, with that, I'll say thank you very much. Thank you very much there, Noel. And look, I'll just get you to stop sharing your presentation with us there. So look, uh, thank you very much, Noel, um, for that. So look, uh, that's an excellent presentation and we'll give you a moment or two there and we'll come back to you there again for questions at the very end, Noel. So now at this stage of the evening, I'm going to ask our next speaker who is Barry Caslin. And Barry is our Chagas Energy and Rural Development Specialist based in Chagas and Longford. Uh, so it's over to you uh, now, Barry, and I'll get you just to uh, turn on your camera there as well. and. Uh, it's all to you now, Barry. Good evening, Brendan. Can you hear me okay? Perfect, Barry, yeah. Okay. Screen sharing okay? That's perfect, Barry, now, yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. Okay. Okay, good evening, everybody. And uh, thanks for the invite, Brendan, to speak here tonight. So this whole area of renewable energy is taking different twists and turns as it has over the years. And uh, I suppose there's a major emphasis on this area of renewable energy, I suppose, part of our decarbonisation challenge in Ireland, not just decarbonisation for the agricultural sector, but also agriculture has a major role to play in the decarbonisation, uh, the removal of fossil fuels in other areas, such as uh, 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 transport, and also in heating of buildings and heating of homes as well. Uh, so there's a, a lot of things happening in this area. And so I just want to draw your attention maybe to one area there, this, the energy fact sheets that are there on the Chagas uh, website. 
there's a number of them there. There's over 20 different uh, energy fact sheets uh, that are looking at energy efficiency and also that look at energy, uh, renewable energy technologies that could be used within agricultural situations. So um, I suppose if you're looking at, uh, looking at energy in general, there's three main areas. So you have heat, you have transport, and you have electricity. We've been doing fairly well on electricity over the last number of years. And that's mainly due to the likes of wind turbines uh, being installed right across the country. So about 40% of our electricity nationally at this point in time is coming from uh, renewable electricity. That's doing quite well. Uh, where we're not doing so well is on renewable heat. That's, we're really struggling on those areas. Um, on renewable transport, we're doing okay, but it's mainly from imported biofuels. So they'd be blended mixes of uh, ethanol with petrol, and there's also mixes of uh, biodiesel with diesel uh, in, in our, it's, uh, that's already coming in pre-blended. So there's not really an indigenous industry. That section is not benefiting farmers at all or benefiting the, um, it's, it's, it's all imported uh, mixtures. But I suppose if all of these for, the, for them to happen, for us to have success in meeting our renewable energy targets or decarbonization targets, you need policy in place and you need supports and you need incentives. And in order for that to happen, um, you know, the, the, the particular incentives that, that, that are, are, have been provided for electricity over the last number of years have been feed-in tariffs uh, that have been made available to support uh, the deployment of wind turbines. Uh, now, there's a challenge that we have to go from 40% from 40% renewable electricity that we have at the moment up to 80% uh, renewable electricity by 2030 so that won't be long coming around uh, so th and there is a long lead in time between planning and all of that for this but what's happening at the moment is there has been a support scheme introduced there called the renewable electricity support scheme um, and that's an auction based uh, competitive auction based scheme and that's really uh, one that would be of interest to farmers because many farmers around the country will be will have been or maybe will be approached by developers who are trying to put large blocks of land under solar panels or under wind turbines. And uh, farmers have been approached to sign up option agreements, to sign up uh, long-term rental agreements or long-term leases on that land. Um, and uh, many of them are, I suppose, don't uh, have, haven't heard about this before. It's all new to them uh, and it can be quite confusing. But I suppose the interesting part is that the reason that this is all happening is because of this RES scheme or Renewable Electricity Support Scheme. So the first auction actually happened uh, in the beginning of August of 2020, and that's going to lead to developments of between 0.5 megawatts up to 119 megawatts. So there's community-based projects, which are less than five megawatts, and then there's larger projects uh, around the country that have been supported through this RES auction process. So you can see there, um, the, around the country there, the successful solar. So the projects funded uh, that will receive the funding under the RES have been between solar and wind. So there's almost 4,000 acres of land or 1,750 hectares of land that potentially will be covered now by solar panels because they've gotten the support through the RES auction uh, uh, scheme. Uh, that will more than likely be under solar panels. And just because we're dealing with Mayo at the moment, it's 8.79 hectares that have got the green light in Mayo on that res auction. So that would be a situation where a developer potentially has come in and uh, signed a long-term agreement with a, with a local farmer there. Um, moving on then to wind, you can see there that there have been uh, 19 wind projects that were successful in that first auction. Uh, which is going to re result in about 479 megawatts of uh, electrical capacity from, re uh, again, renewable electricity being added to the national grid. Now, I mentioned there that um, that's the support that's there for, you know, the larger scale uh, wind, larger scale uh, solar. And we don't have a lot of solar at the moment. We have a fair bit of wind around the country at the moment uh, in terms of wind turbines that have been deployed. But we have very little on solar. And th this, is, this is going to get going through that RES scheme. But we've had a very little success on the area of renewable heat. 
But what was introduced in 2019, in June of 2019, was the uh, SSRH, or the Support Scheme for Renewable Heat. So all these acronyms that we have to learn off, RES for electricity and SSRH for heat. So this is to help the government meet its targets on renewable heat that we have going forward. So the phase one was the introduction for non-domestic. So this is covering, um, the SSRH doesn't cover your own domestic house, but it will cover industrial business and public sector applications. And it does include agriculture as well. So we are seeing situations where pig units, poultry units, are putting in these biomass boilers. There's, uh, I suppose we should have been seeing the likes of hotels installing them, uh, nursing homes over the last couple of years as well since this was, was in introduced. But I think that the likes of the hotels and nursing homes had other battles to contend with over the last two years, which uh, I suppose uh, had other priorities. But now with energy prices, the way they're creeping up again, I think there's going to be a very strong emphasis on the use of the likes of biomass, whether that's wood chip or wood chip coming from the forestry industry um, as a byproduct or pulp wood from the forestry industry, or the likes of wood pellets, which is a, which is a, a more densified uh, uh, product that occupies a lot less space and uh, has, has um... now just moving on to the tariffs there. The tariffs, the support scheme for renewable heat is um, is it's based on a tiered payment system that goes from naught to 300 megawatt hours. The first is paid at 56 euro 60 cent per megawatt hour, or it's five euro 5.66 cent per kilowatt hour. And as you can see, as you go down to tier two, you drop down to 30 euro 20 cent per megawatt hour, which is the same as three euro and two cent, it's 3.02 cent per kilowatt hour. Uh, and then as you go, so the more you burn, the less you get paid. And I suppose this was in contrast to the scheme in Northern Ireland, where the more you burnt, you got paid the same all year round. So the SSRH is paying you on a tiered basis, um, a lower payment, the more you burn. So you can see there that the sweet spot within the scheme is people that are burning between not to uh, 1,000 uh, megawatt hours uh, per year. As you as you go into tier three, you're you're dropping down to five euro per megawatt hour. So the bigger payments are here in, in tier one and tier two, and these are payments that could be uh, received for 15 years. So it's quite an attractive scheme. It's very very makes a lot of sense for hotels, hospitals, nursing homes. Um, places with large heat or hot water use, you know, to consider uh, these biomass boilers, uh, especially if they have a supply chain uh, that, that's available to them as well. I just put in a payback there as well, and just put in a poultry example. I mean, you could put in um, a hotel here as the example, but if a poultry unit put in a 400 kilowatt boiler, and if the cost of that was 210,000 euro, and it's running for half the year, which would be producing 1.7 uh, million kilowatt hours or 1,700 megawatt hours uh, per year of heat. The oil that that will be displacing will be in the region of around 160,000 litres of oil per year. And if you put a value on that oil of 92 cents per litre, which is creeping up all the time because oil, oil is approaching $100 a barrel. So if you took it at 92 cents per litre, that'd be worth 147,660 or that would cost 147,660 per year if you were using oil only. But if you were to see how much wood chip would be required to displace that oil, the wood chip would be coming in at around 5.2 cent per kilowatt hour, which is around half the price of oil. So at that price, it's the wood chip would be costing 88,000 euro per year. So you can see here that the savings per year is about 71,000 euro per year. So you're getting a good saving without any support scheme for renewable heat. You're getting a good saving here um, already. So you're getting a payback in under three years. And I just changed those figures today, actually, because I had that figure down at around 66 cent because it was hovering there for the last couple of years at around 66 cent per litre. But all of a sudden, oil has exploded in price. And um, the higher the price of oil goes, the quicker these paybacks. This payback was around six years. Um, now, when we add on 
it, so it's, it's this payback is down to three years now at this stage without any support scheme for renewable heat. So you can see where we, where we add on these tiered payments that we had on the previous slide. So from, from coming from here, and we add on these tiered payments here of tier one at 16,980, tier two at 21,140, and we do creep into tier three here based on the megawatt hours of heat that we're generating here or using. So it's a total of uh, 40,120. When we add those together, that's 111,280 euro of, um, of a, a saving, which is given a payback in, under, in just around two years. So that's a, quite a significant payback. So it does make a lot of sense for, I suppose, hotels, hospitals, um, those places with a large heat and hot water demand, poultry units, pig units, to consider these biomass boilers. Um, because they will get this payment of the 40,120 for 15 years as well. So that's quite a quite a, an attractive um, um, situation. I suppose there's an opportunity here for farmers to sell renewable heat. This is, these are the opportunities that will be uh, coming here. So farmers can sell renewable heat. It doesn't help um, necessarily decarbonize the agricultural sector by selling the heat, but it does help decarbonize our energy sector which is a big challenge to decarbonize as well. There's opportunities here for, I suppose, farmers like structures and we, we, the structures are there for the selling of milk to the dairy co-op. Structures are there for selling beef to the meat factories, but we need those structures for renewable energy products as well. So we will need to see the development of more biomass trade centers where this pulp wood from forestry, it could be purpose grown energy crops like willow or Escanthus, or it could be um, uh, crops, fiber, uh, fiber crops from forestry that are fast growing, that could be assimilated in a local biomass trade center and chipped, dried, and delivered into the end user in the shape or format that they require, whether that's in chip form, whether it's in pellet form, um, or, or briquette form. There's different ways that they can be all uh, processed for the end user. I suppose the main um, agricultural feedstocks uh, that we will be looking at in the future will be the likes of you know for to develop supply chains around will be pulp wood from forestry uh, straw we produce about a million tons of straw in this country every year i know there's different uses for the straw but um purpose grown energy crops uh, as i mentioned there we will see opportunities for grass silage for biogas and anaerobic digestion and i'll talk about that in, in, in a minute as well I just also want to mention other things that are happening as well is that a micro generation scheme is due to be introduced fairly soon. The details that we, we, we received in the last couple of weeks uh, about it, it's going to open for domestic in the coming days and it's going to open for agriculture and other businesses in the third quarter of this year. So probably around September of this year, uh, 2022, it will open up for, um, uh, for businesses. But it'll start off uh, for domestic houses for, for uh, less than six kilowatt uh, solar PV arrays. And there'll be, um, there'll be um, um, a grant payable for domestic, but I'm not going to cover the domestic here now. I'm going to look at the, uh, the, the farm-based examples here. So uh, there's the, we will have the ability to export the grid extra electricity that's been produced at times of the day when we can't actually use it, utilize it ourselves. So instead of having to put in batteries and store it in expensive batteries, now we have the option of selling this excess electricity back to the grid. And you can see here, like we have lots of uh, sheds, lots of sh shed space across Ireland on farms that, that are ideal for micro generation. The payment will be through what's called a clean export premium, a CEP. Uh, and the, the, there'll be a payment of 13.5 cent per kilowatt hour, and that'll be payable on up to 80% of what's been of what's produced. So this is, um, I suppose, there's really a focus on this on self-consumption because if you can offset your own electricity use, and we all know what electricity prices are at the moment, they're gone well over 25 cent per kilowatt hour unless you're locked into some deal. Um, and there's no doubt about it, when that deal expires, you will be facing increasing electricity prices very, very soon. Uh, and who knows what way electricity prices go because 40% of our electricity in this country is produced from gas. And we have really 
uh, major issues with, in terms of gas supply and where it's coming from at the moment due to the uh, issues that, were in, that's, that are happening in, in, in Eastern Europe. Um, I just wanted to make you aware as well of the TAMS grant that's available of 40% for most farmers and 60% for young farmers. Um, it's, it's available for solar PV systems. There's a lot of energy efficient equipment that's covered under TAMS as well, especially in the pig and the poultry sectors. Um, heat exchangers are available under, under for dairy as well. So TAM also supports battery storage up to six uh, kilowatt uh, peak. Um, large farmers can claim an SEI, the Sust Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. They have what's called Better Energy Community Grants of 30%. So suppose all of this um, is relevant to the likes of the potato, the horticulture, pigs, poultry, and the dairy sector, um, who would have a lot of electric motive equipment, motors, uh, and lighting uh, to contend with. So if they can offset as much of that electricity as they can themselves, and maybe get a 40% grant uh, from TAMS, that, 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 that would be um, a big advantage. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention as well to uh, other things that are happening around the country is this project Clover. And the picture in your top right corner is that of an anaerobic digester or a biogas unit. That's a very small scale one now, but um, there are, these digesters are available at different scales. And it's essentially where you're taking organic material, that organic material could be anything from, you know, it could be um, grass silage, it could be f food waste, uh, it could be cattle slurry, farmyard manure, um, they can be the feedstocks that go into it. And I suppose the key thing with these digesters is that you have feedstocks to keep it fed all year round. But um, the, I suppose most digesters across Europe and Germany and other places like that, they're based, on, uh, they're based on CHP or combined heat and power, where you're producing heat and electricity in the one process. I think what's coming down the track is, uh, is more of a focus on um, you know, decarbonizing the gas network. So, Gas Networks Ireland are doing are doing a lot of um, research on and lobbying on this whole area of developing a renewable heat incentive around biomethane. So, this is where you upgrade the gas that's produced in these digesters. It's called biogas, and you can clean that gas up because the gas is around sixty percent uh, uh, methane, maybe thirty five percent carbon dioxide, and the rest is hydrogen sulfide and other minor gases. So you're cleaning up the, the cleaning, the, taking out the carbon dioxide, taking out the hydrogen sulfide, and you're left with over 97% methane, which is the equivalent of propane gas. And that gas is called biomethane. And that's a green gas, which could be injected in with the existing propane gas network. Uh, and um, that, that's a possibility that we will see that happening through government support in the near future. There's a, this project called Project Clover that's been uh, run by Gas Networks Ireland is trying to develop this flag, flagship project in Mitchellstown uh, as a kickstart project um, where you will see 20 local AD plants in the region around Mitchellstown and where that gas will be upgraded to biomethane and injected into the gas grid. Um, so I just wanted to finish off by saying that um, farming will have to adapt to wider challenges posed by climate change. Farmers manage the countryside and they have a vital role to play in the implementation of the country's low carbon transition plans. Um, Standardised environmental labelling of food, including carbon supported by farm level emissions and accounting will, more, will be playing a greater role in the future. So you probably will see, you know, the, the labelling of food, of butter, of milk, et cetera. And a lot of this will come back to the farm and the emissions that are, are, are associated at farm level as well. Farmers are going to need access to independent and cost-effective advice on farm demonstrations and information related to nature-friendly farming practices and energy options. I think there's a whole learning curve required here. Those energy prices are soaring with oil reaching over $80 per barrel um, and approaching $100 per barrel. Carbon taxes will increase on subsequent budgets. Um, we can use proven technologies. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We're not, we're coming from a low base here in Ireland where we haven't really adopted these technologies over the last number of years. We can learn what has been done in other European countries and take those lessons to, uh, I suppose, go forward with a better strategy as regards um, adopting renewables in this country. So 
hand it back to you, Brendan, after that. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing here. Thank you very much, Barry. That's excellent there, an excellent presentation. Uh, so look, thank you very much uh, indeed to yourself and Noel this evening for their two presentations. So now just at this stage of the evening, I just have a very short poll uh, just to gauge your views uh, on our two topics that we ha we've had this evening. So I'm just going to launch a short little poll. Uh, you should be seeing it coming up on your screens uh, at this moment. So um, if you would like to just to vote, um, we have two questions this evening. Um, so the first question there, ladies and gentlemen, is would you consider forestry as an option on your farm in the future? And we have a, two options. We have a yes or a no option. And the second question there is, do you feel renewable energy has a role to play on your farm in the future based on what Barry has said? So we leave the poll running for a couple of moments and uh, I'll minimize the screen and um, we have a lot of farmers on and we have a lot of time for questions as well this evening. So uh, I know Noel has been busy answering some of the questions uh, off air. So look, thanks to Noel for that. So at this stage of the evening, um, I'm now going to uh, ask my colleague Indra Gagan uh, to uh, start um, putting the questions uh, live to our panelists this evening. So again, look at uh, plenty of time for questions, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, put your questions to our panelists. So it's over to you uh, now, Inda. Thanks very much, Brendan. And uh, thanks to the two gentlemen there, Noel and Barry, on uh, two very informative presentations. And um, there's a few questions there coming in. The first one there is for Noel. And I suppose it's one that, that maybe in, is commonly occurring. What if there's a water main um, through the land? How is that... Um, how was that coped with when planting forestry you know? Yeah, um, when, the, when a forester is maybe preparing a forestry application, um, there's a whole load of infrastructure that's now mapped on a lot of the, I suppose, the, the map viewers. So there's one particular environmental viewer that's used widely by, by foresters. Um, it's, it's a Department of Agriculture. It's called the iForest system. And it has numerous layers. And one of those layers is water pipes, mains, wells, uh, water e extraction points. And for each of those, uh, there are strict environmental guidelines as regards um, keeping the trees back from uh, the root or the location of those um, uh, uh, pipes or ab abstraction points. So, um, Obviously, uh, it's important that the forester, um, he transfers what he sees on, the com on, on his computer to uh, on the ground and he pegs out the location. If it's a group water scheme, he might uh, talk to the uh, maybe a member of the group water scheme. Obviously, the, the, the landowner themselves um, should uh, be aware of the route. But uh, suffice to say that um, trees will not be planted uh, on a mains or, or close to uh, water ac abstra abstraction points. Thanks very much, Noel. And just another one there. Um, is there a minimum area? that you can plant or what is the minimum area? There are minimum areas and uh, yeah, very, very small areas actually. For conifers, it's one hectare. Uh, for broadleaf trees, it's 0.1 of a hectare, which is about a quarter of an acre. There's also a minimum width uh, of uh, 20 meters uh, for a broadleaf forest and uh, 30 meters for a conifer forest on average, that is. Now, the only comment I'd make in relation to those very small areas is obviously the economies of scale, um, the cost of um, fencing, uh, a series of very, very small areas will drive up the potential cost of development. So that's, that's something that can be a potential drawback, uh, particularly to foresters who, you know, will, may shy away from very, very small areas, maybe under five acres. So that's something that you'd need to bear in mind if you are looking at planting a particularly small area. Thanks very much, Noel. And a question here for Barry. Um, how close are we to seeing the establishment of the trading centres you referred to? Yeah, it's um, th there's already some trading centres around the country al al uh, already in existence. And I suppose they've mainly emanated from the forestry industry um, so there's a number of good examples of that at the moment. A lot of fantastic examples in Austria, in Denmark, in Germany, 
of you know very good examples of trade centers um you know and what they how they should look like um but it's it's essentially you know a place with a way bridge and uh, you know where you can actually measure moisture contents where you can uh, you know have a, a little laboratory there where you can you know do even a chemical analysis if necessary on the on the timber or the wood chip to make sure that uh, it's meeting the market requirement but uh, I think, yeah, there are examples of it, but we probably need more. And how do we get more of them? So we probably need some kind of incentives to, I suppose, get these up and running in, in various parts uh, around the country, you know, because obviously there's a cost associated with it, with space. But, um, you know, there, the, I don't know whether it's a TAMS type scheme is going to be needed to see more deployment of them around the country, maybe something like that. Okay. And just um, you mentioned Thames there, just in the whole area of the, the micro generation, is there Thames grant available um, for, we'll say, installing the PV technology on sheds, we'll say on shed roofs? For the micro generation? Is for it? the micro generation, yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question because I mentioned there the clean export premium that's available at micro generation you won't get the clean export premium and the TAMS grant at the same time. But what's available and what may be um, an option for some people when this comes available is called, this is called a clean export guarantee. And this will be paid by the utility. So for example, if you're dealing with Pinergy or Electric Ireland or uh, SSE or Panda, whoever your electricity supplier is around the country, you can lock in into a clean export guarantee with them and forfeit the, uh, the and forfeit the clean export premium payment, and then you can yes you can get a TAMS payment and the clean export guarantee together, but you can't get a clean export premium, which is this payment that's there for fifteen years. You won't be able to get that and TAMS together. Okay, thanks very much, Barry. And just another question there, you mentioned about um, some of these solar farms and that. Um, and options, we'll say people being signed up for options. What would your advice to a farmer if he's approached by either a wind farm or we'll say a solar farm to, to sign up? Um, what would your advice be there to them in terms of the legal end of things <clears throat> and that, Barry? Yeah, it's, 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 it can be very daunting to read a, a contract. So the first thing that's put in front of you is a heads of terms, which is the terms and conditions essentially of a, um, a, an option agreement that, and that will eventually turn into a long-term lease. And uh, farmers are being asked to sign this and there is what's called exclusivity agreements. And I suppose if, if, if a developer goes into an area their biggest concern is that if the farmer is trading them off against another developer, that you're trying to get better prices out of them or better prices per hectare for solar or per turbine, or whatever it may be, the development that's going on, that this developer is paying for the planning and the grid connection associated with that particular project. So they want to make sure that they won't be out of pocket by the fact that the farmer goes off at another developer on that same area of ground. So that's their concern. So um, you can see it from that perspective why a developer needs to lock a farmer in uh, to make sure that they're not spending money uh, wastefully or that it's, it's a point is exercised on their behalf. So um, the, I, I think what's key to all of this is that you do bring this lease agreement, uh, uh, this option agreement to a solicitor who understands energy and not all rural solicitors understand energy law because it can be a very complex area. And um, sometimes they send this to some other law firm that understands the legal uh, context of it and the, uh, to, to get it run over uh, by, by maybe a, another law firm. But there are lots of legal firms out there who are very, very expert in this area and they've brought in that expertise by partners within their firms who are well capable of answering those kind of questions. So um, I would advise them to make sure that it's, you know, goes to the right solicitor because this is something that you're locking into for 25 years. Your land is going to be, you know, under a long-term lease, but it does take some time. There is a lead-in time. So during that option period, that option period might be for three years, for four years, generally for up to five years. And that gives the developer that bit of time 
in order to get their ducks in a row, to get their planning permission sorted, to get their grid connection, connection sorted. Once that's all done, then they're ready to go to a, a res auction. And if they bid in the res auction, like the one I described in the presentation earlier on, and if they're successful in that auction, then they can tell the farmer, we need you to get your cattle off the land in the morning or next week because we're moving in and with the solar panels and this this 20 year lease or 25 year lease is going to kick in from next week. Uh, and so it, it is important that you go to a solicitor. There's other issues as well, Enda. We could spend a good while talking about this, but yeah. there's issues on, on the taxation side as well to be conscious of that, you know, that at the moment you will qualify for agricultural relief uh, on, on, on the land. It is, it is deemed agricultural land, but who knows in subsequent budgets that could change that agricultural relief may not be available, but it is there at the moment. So it is important that from a succession point of view that you explore all these options about, you know, how the land, uh, you know, who's going to, whose name is it going to be in when the option agreement and the lease agreement is, is all pulled together. That's great. Barry. And uh, may I, sorry, yeah. may I just add in relation to that, yes. uh, there are there are forestry owners being approached, say, by wind energy companies there to put turbines into forests. So it's just important that a uh, forestry owner does realize that if they do give up land or give up forest, should I say, to, to leasing for wind turbines, any forest that is cleared for the wind turbines and their ancillary uses, uh, will, they will have to find an alternative piece of land to, for planting to replace that land that has been taken out for the wind turbines. Okay. Thanks very much, Noel. Um, as Barry said there, it's, it's very important. It's a daunting time, so it's important to check it out with the solicitor and accountant and that. Um, uh, question there for you, Noel, um, the agroforestry. Um, is there, we'll say, the possibility, you, you spoke about the possibility of the payment being extended. Do you think this is, is, will be extended in your opinion or what's your opinion on that? Well, um, I can't say for definite, but yeah. certainly, certainly um, there has been very strong lobbying for the, the, that five-year premium to be substantially uh, lengthened. Um, the department does see that it is seen as a disincentive to farmers getting involved in agroforestry. Um, so, you know, I suppose, look, uh, I, I would be hopeful that um, the agroforestry scheme that is that comes with uh, the new forestry program during 2023 um, will, I suppose, offer maybe better uh, financial uh, incentive, incentives, but uh, maybe even more importantly, it may well offer more flexibility in the model of agroforestry that might be offered to, to farmers. Thanks very much, Noel. And is there many examples of agroforests in, in the West of Ireland, in, in Mayo, for example? I'm afraid there are not. Uh, I'm not aware of any agroforestry in Mayo. Um, there are um, three or four in, um, in uh, Galway. And indeed, um, uh, I had a farm walk on a, a, a quite a recent agroforestry plantation there in Hedford. Um, so, um, you know, we're, we, we, we're hoping to, to use that for further uh, demonstrations there over the next um, certainly year or so. But unfortunately, um, the main concentration of agroforestry plots are down south, um, but uh, we certainly would expect to see more uh, and hopefully um, more in Mayo over the coming years. Thanks. Thanks very much, Noel. A uh, question for Barry there. Um, do you think the power purchase agreements have a part to play in encouraging farmers to install renewable energy technologies on their farm? Yeah, I think power purchase agreements will be very, very important. I mean, th there's possibilities for farmers also to have private wire networks whereby, and this is something that's really happened in the, in the UK as well, where you would see a private wire network where a farmer could maybe build a digester and supply electricity maybe to into a, an industrial estate, uh, supply maybe heat uh, along with that into the industrial estate. But private purchase uh, agreements, you know, between a third party that's the producer of the electricity 
and the end user of the electricity, it could be a utility, they will have a major role to play in the future, yeah. Thanks very much. And we'll say just there, a follow on comment from the um, from the um, we'll say the the establishment of the trading centres. Do you think that farmer co-ops could set up? These could be set up by farmer co-ops in in an area, the bio trading centres. Yeah, I think the farmers trust the co-op ethos because um, they're familiar with that from the dairy industry and I think it's a trusted method of uh, cooperation so yes I think that uh, the co-op ethos is a good way of doing it and already that there is a very good example of a co-op in Waterford uh, around energy mm-hmm. uh, and there will be I think there'll be more of those uh, around energy in the future yeah and, and I mean ICOS um, are, are already you know l- looking to get more I suppose energy type cooperatives up and running. So I think there's a there's an emphasis there on, on this area as well as the dairy type cooperatives. Yeah. Okay, and Barry. And um, finally, then I'll I'll leave you with a, a a very easy question to to answer. Why are energy prices so high at the moment? Oh God, that's. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I suppose, yeah, like if you look at the amount of electricity that's been generated from renewables at the moment, uh, it's increased hugely in Ireland, you know, in recent years. And 40% of our electricity at the moment has been generated from um, uh, renewables. But uh, there's also 40% of our electricity is being generated by burning gas. Uh, and 10% then is coming from burning oil and coal as well. So there's a big dependency on fossil fuels. And that means that we're very susceptible really to, I suppose, changes in their prices. Uh, and as the price of gas in particular, it's increased hugely on wholesale markets in recent months. Um, and I suppose, you know, the, the, the global economy is recovering from the effects of the pandemic as well. That that's, has a, a, had a major impact on it also. Uh, there's, there's a real surge in, in economies and there's bottlenecks that are being created there at the moment and that's putting an upward pressure on prices uh, in industries everywhere, I suppose. So that's that. That's the real. And then I suppose there's been other issues there as well. There's been two, in, in, from an Irish perspective only. There's been two power stations that have been out of action for, and that's partly due to COVID. There, you had the the um, the gas fire plant at Whitegate in Cork, and you had the Huntstown um, plant in Dublin. And the, both of them together, they supply about fifteen percent of Ireland's entire electricity. So uh, that, that has been an issue, but I think the, um, the one at uh, Huntstown is back up and running again since uh, late October. So that has taken some of the pressure back off again. And there was also issues with lack of wind because you know, th- there is an issue there as well as this transition from uh, you know, fossil fuels to renewables. You are going to have hiccups along the way. And there are times you know, when you get in frosty weather and you're not producing any electricity from wind. So that can be a challenge in this transition as well. And we will see new technologies evolving with demand-led pricing in relation to when we turn on our washing machines or dishwashers. And you will see different prices coming with smart metering in the future to, to contend with that issue of uh, you know, uh, the fact that you know, uh, renewable electricity is coming from intermittent sources when the wind is blowing, when the sun is shining. So you know, do we turn on our devices at those times when there's a higher availability of those resources is probably something we will be looking at in the future as well. But that's really a summary of why um, wind hasn't been blown at times when we needed it, and that has caused a higher demand for fossil fuels as well. Thanks very much, Barry. So um, look, at, I'll, I'll hand back to Brendan and thanks Barry and Noel for, for answering the questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Inda, as well. And indeed, uh, some great questions there. And thanks again to our, to our panellists here. Just before we, we finish up this evening, we, we conducted a short little poll there uh, at the start of this evening um, at the end of the two presentations. So just to just to show your viewers um, what the exact results were. Uh, so just we're just going to share the results there with you all. Uh, so the first question that we asked you there this evening was, would you consider forestry as an option on your farm in the future? 
and that 51% of the viewers this evening uh, indicate that they would, uh, you know, indicate that they would be interested in forestry, with 49% indicating that uh, they mightn't be interested at the moment. Um, certainly, uh, in terms of question two, there was a clear winner, and the question was, do you feel renewable energy has a role to play on your farm in the future? With 92% of our viewers who voted this evening, uh, to 75% of our viewers voted, um, and 92% of those felt that uh, renewable energy has a role to play on their farm in the future. So uh, certainly um, that has um, you know, maybe an emerging area of interest for a lot of farmers this e on this evening. So finally, just, just to conclude this evening, we just went, we're out of time and we've gone slightly over, but I'd like to thank you uh, at home this evening for staying with us, uh, engaging with us. Special thanks to Barry uh, for and, and Noel for giving great presentations with us. Thanks to Inda for sharing the questions and answers this evening with us. Uh, and indeed, look, at, we hope that you found this webinar very beneficial. Uh, we will be getting the recording uploaded to the Chagas Mayo YouTube channel in the coming days. And indeed, uh, so keep an eye out for that. All our other webinars from this previous series and indeed the current series are also available there on that uh, Chagas Mayo YouTube channel. So check it out there for all the latest videos there in the region as well. All that's left for me to say is that we'll be back again next week for the final episode in this spring series, where we'll be having, we will be having a dedicated organic farming seminar and webinar, uh, which is very timely due to the new organic scheme, which was launched uh, recently by the Department of Agriculture um, a number of weeks ago. So put that date in your diary for next Wednesday night, 2nd of March at 8 p.m. And indeed, you can join again using the same link as this evening. So it's good night from us all here in County Mayo and see you all again next week and stay safe, folks. Nice, right? Thank you. Bye-bye.